today we're, we're looking at Deck of Many's Humblewood campaign setting. Off the bat, this is a very interesting book. You will need the 5e rule set uh, in order to play this. If you're thinking about looking for a system that's very different from Forgotten Realms, um, different from Eberron. So when you gave this to me, I fell in love with it immediately. I love the humble folk and I love the bird folk. And I like that they have a very, very complete lore that's a part of it that you can choose to expand upon or just go by what they've written. It's been pretty great and I've had this for about a week and I'm actually going to run a, camp a short campaign with it, this in uh, August just because I just fell hell head over heels for this. You know, I, I, I'm really happy with this book because usually when I read when I read source books from like a, like, like a new uh, campaign idea, usually they become just a, a book that has just, to me, like new races, new classes, and that's it. There's nothing more it can really give me. But I, I always felt that if you're making a, a new world, the mythology of the world has to be really important. And I, I just, what I love the best, the best thing about this book is that I love the, the lore. I love how the, the gods are, are created, how they, how, they're, how they manifest the world, how, how the checks and balances of how nature works. You know, what's, what are the dangers of the world and, and what's, what's keeping the world from functioning? And they do such a great job in, in this. It's weird. It's like, it's like, it's, it, it seems very real, but it's a very, it has a very fantastic fairy tale feel to it. So I, I adore the world, world building. I love how like the upper class are literally those who live in the tops of trees and the lower you get, the lower class you are and how they have that separation and how the bird folk, if they choose to live on the ground, that they are considered odd and the the humble folk who have made it to the top of upper parts of the trees are considered they've made it they're wealthy and um they take on the upper bird folk um like mindset and i found that was very interesting and going back to what you said about fantasy and, and fairy tale lore i like how the vulpin the uh the fox oriented creatures do pull from that because it directly says you know um that they have a reputation that they don't earn and it is drawing from the old fox lore where they're tricksters and they're thieves and they're sneaky and you can choose to have like a completely you know nice and benign uh, vulpin character if you'd like and it's just it's fantastic yeah i i, I do like the fact that even though there's species that have their own like set of ways but you could you could you don't have to follow that you could do your own character your own way um uh, is there any what do you think about the the uh, classes, the uh, the new um, subclasses that they had? Uh, did you feel that that was a, a good addition? That was a great addition because they're built around these new creatures and like their body types. So it, it definitely helps. It's it's not just like okay, you're this character and you can only be whatever races D and D has. It has these specialized races for like the body types, especially since I think the the shortest one is about two foot eleven inches. Mm. So the, that whatever class, subclass it has, is built for tiny, tiny creatures and not for like a Goliath. And it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I do like the new spells that they have here. Um, if, if you get to know me very well, you know that I love spells. I love magic. I like when they really, I get, I get tired of the same spells over and over again. I'm tired of fireball and magic missile. So I really like they included the, not only, see the, what I really like about this is that, yeah, they include new spells, but they actually thought it out. So it makes it feel like it's part of the world. And I really yeah. appreciate that. And I, I don't know, though I wish they had more spells. I think I think that's a wise thing to do, especially when you're introducing a new world. You don't want to use, introduce too many new things too fast, because then uh, readers get um, uh, frustrated or uh, intimidated by the, the amount of lore. And that's absolutely fair, because this is 226 pages of just lore and classes and world building. So if you have like 11 pages per class, that's a lot. And I've downloaded the free resources, which they advise in the page too, if you want maps and stuff, and they have the, the language is a, is a font. So if you have like Photoshop or something, you can toss that in and make your own documents. It seems like when I, when I sent you this PDF, you already wanted to play this right away once you started reading it. Yeah. Um, what, what about it made you jump, like jump at you and say, okay, I gotta, I gotta play this right away? Uh, just that it had anything that I could imagine. It had, it had the classes, it had the the classes that were built specifically for some races. It had, you know, the the own social classes, like I said, um, where the upper class were high in the trees and they have this whole, um, there's a tree called, I believe it's called the Alder Tree, that is like the main city tree and it's sentient. 
and just the fact that druids can communicate with the trees and make its own city from this tree and it will be like okay i'll make like this uh this little underground town by adjusting my roots and just like have the humble folk live there just stuff like that just like they put a lot of effort into this and i absolutely want to play in this world anything that i could be like oh i wonder if they have this they have it and they, they even have some maps which a lot of campaign books i've looked at it's just text they don't have maps or anything and the art in the pages is just absolutely gorgeous. Like, my jaw has dropped a few times looking at some of the art. And it goes along with um, some of the text. So it's like, okay, what is this? Oh, it's right here. They have an example of it. This is amazing. Yeah, overall, I, I had a really great time reading this book. It's it's some adventure books, source books you read. And it's it's like homework, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it's it's like you I, you try to read in and, and it, the rules get really technical and the world doesn't doesn't, doesn't really make much sense um, but it, it was very easy to read uh, it was fun to read so in just its illustrations it's very interesting how they kind of subvert expectations because you see you know that they have little birds and you think that they're going to be rogues or they're going to be healers but then i think it's on the cover they have like this little owl in plate armor and that's your warrior and then you see that they have the servants the the deer and elk and, and all that and you're like okay they're naturally going to be the druids and the healers but then one of the uh, illustrations i immediately thought of brian of tarth from game of thrones just this female just like she looks like she's going to kick your butt but she's also very feminine like that is really good so they kind of do different things they even have a um a bard that is a porcupine or a hedgehog and its clothes are going through its uh its clothing it's, it's absolutely adorable and he, and they i think they use that illustrations in particular because they say that that race cannot have armor because its quills poke with poke through the armor and can damage it so they have a natural like plus 14 armor it's like that's really clever like, I never would have thought of that. Like, I would have been like, oh, I want to be this, and I'll just, I'll make it a, a knight, and it's going to have armor, and the rules say, no, it has its natural armor. It's like, oh, okay, that's so cool. And as you said at the very beginning, just the, the gods, how everything's balanced, and they only have, like, one evil, which is subjective. So I at libraries, I teach gaming. Well, I did before, of course, COVID hit. Um, and um, there's a lot of young kids there, and, I'm, and I've been asked to do, uh, like, D&D games there. And... Uh, some D &D, I, I'm not sure which ones would be a good introduction for them, but I wish I would have saw this book months ago because I think this this is a great game to introduce kids. Not that it's just a kids game at all. I, I it's it's uh, I think I mean adults. I think it's I think even um, my my uh, um, some of the older crowd would enjoy this a lot as well. You know, again, it has a very different, unique flavor to it. Oh, definitely. When I opened Lost Mine and Fandolver for the first time, even though it's only like maybe 20 pages long, I floundered. I absolutely floundered, and I was panicking like I didn't know, I didn't understand anything. And that was April. And just looking at this, I'm like, this is, I wish I had started on this. This is very, I understand things. It's a more pleasant world. It's, it spells everything. It spells everything out for you, but also doesn't hold your hand. It, it doesn't baby you too much. It makes you think a little bit, but it's still like this would have been a more gentler um, introduction to D and D as a very new DM. And I, bear I think I played maybe four games before I started DMing, so I'm very new to this as a whole. Actually, what we did not talk about is how you can play the other D and D races in this game. Like it perfectly allows for that mesh of having, you know, like halflings or elves or orcs or or whatever uh, join this game. All right, excellent. Well, uh, viewers. Um... Uh, let us know what you think in the comments below. Have you played this game? Um, um, uh, what would you like to tell other people about this game that, that you've experienced? And um, yes, thank you uh, very much, everyone. Um, and have a great day.